Thousands, thousands of women and new talents have mm. entered the world of IT thanks to Chequitas. It's an NGO that is made up of young women and men that share one common goal, to increase diversity in the world of IT and to fight for a higher level of digital proficiency among women and in the new generation. Chequitas teach how to program, how to code and how to work with data. They organize workshops, summer camps or evening courses at various levels of advancement and they also help their graduates to find their dream jobs in the field. This is all why any discussion about education of women in technical fields and their support on labor market can hardly be imaginable without Chekitas involved. So let's listen to Bara Binova, that is a co-founding and governing board member of the company. And besides that, she also is a vice dean at the Faculty of Informatics, Masaryk University, which is another place where a new generation of software engineers is educated. So Bara, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you very much. For the invitation, uh, I'm more so glad because uh, I, I'm following uh, the recap introduction, uh, which is a nice line to um, actually understanding how the landscape of research is changing nowadays. Um, and my talk, I will also try to like go through my research into like the need of diversity in my research, which is, which is like in the software engineering community, and uh, actually following up to understand why we need diversity in this landscape and how we can help uh, the situation uh, getting better uh, because what we see especially in case of Chiquitas is that there are like lots of uh, sleeping talents and reservoirs of talents who could join us in technology and they are just like waiting for the right kind of invitation. In Chiquitas we are successful in providing this kind of invitation which means that the interest in tech education is on rise in the Czech Republic and we are really happy about that. Uh, of course, we are just a small non-profit, so we want to invite like everybody to join such an effort by understanding uh, the context from the point of view of us being in technology. So, uh, to introduce a little bit uh, how my interest also in talking about this topic from the two perspective of my research and Chiquitas came into place is that like as being uh, in the scientific community I have access to the legends of software engineering to the brightest minds and one of those examples is Ivar Jakobsen who is the author of the UML language we all use actually in the software engineering community he has a small son and uh, the, the other day we are talking about the topic uh, where he said like I'm going to school to talk to little children about like why the wrong people choose to study software engineering and the right people do not. And it like came to a very interesting <coughs> conversation, understanding that actually we are kind of like eliminating part of their kids uh, early on uh, to navigate them away from computing, uh, letting them believe that they are not a good fit for, for computing. Uh, so that like think in, in uh, some, some thinking and, and thoughts and, and I would like to bring uh, here some like interesting insights and maybe like aha moments uh, about this topic. Uh, to introduce myself a little further, so my research is in the field of software architecture so I will like do a little um, uh, like look through like why we need diversity in software architecture community and why the need is rising, like why is it happening and, and what can change towards the better if we improve the situation. I'm also a co-founder of Chequitas, uh, which uh, is an organization starting in 2014 and I will try to like tell you more about it because I believe that many, especially like in the room, if you are from Brno, you've heard about it because uh, Chequitas started with its first activities here in Brno. Um, uh, but I will try to like introduce what is the scope of the activities nowadays and, and what studies we run to understand what is happening and especially like how to like help the, the uh, situation because uh, in Chiquitas we are towards the action, like not really discussing what's happening, but what we can effectively do. And uh, I'm also like vice dean uh, at Masaryk University. What, what is uh, really great about this role is that I'm in touch with companies. I'm the chair of the Association of Industrial Partners. So I spend a lot of time in companies and that's where I see that certain skill sets are really underrepresented in tech. It's not just about like women, men, 
there's certain skills that we are really lacking. So let's just start thinking differently about how, how to appreciate different talents in tech because the role of different talents is rising and we are not acknowledging that. We are still like uh, judging them like as fr first class and second class competencies. So that is something that could change the narrative very strongly. So um, like my claim, like if you should have like one uh, takeaway from this talk, like I put it first so that you understand <coughs> what it would be. And it is that I believe that the reason why women self-select away from tech because there is often like self-selection, they just decide not to go in that direction, is the very reason why we need them in. Because they say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I have different interests and, and I, I, I like other fields, so it does not combine well with tech. And uh, I'm more into communication than to just like pure technology focus. These are exactly the reasons why we need them in. And they give them as reason why they go away. So that actually, is why we need to talk about this topic to like, let them understand that uh, we need these competencies in the field. So um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my research, so my research in software engineering and software architecture, and there the landscape is changing. So really like over the past 20 years, and it's the time while like, I, I started my studies in uh, the last century, so it is really like the last, last uh, 20 years, the landscape is changing enormously and the software engineering and software architecture community and the need for the skill sets is changing. Um, to introduce like what is my scope and what, what I do is that I'm a software architect. So what we do is we architect systems just the way, uh, just the same way as like building architects, architect that's it, are their buildings. But uh, we like, are not architecting a separate building like a, like a building construction architect would do. What we rather do is that we are like a city plan uh, architect. So like the urban planners, urban architects. Because when you look at the nowadays the systems, they are largely distributed and we heard it in the, in the recap introduction. They are largely distributed and they interconnect like many different systems actually that touch the cyber and physical world at the same time. Uh, when you think about like the work of an uh, urban planner, then they do not care about how each individual building looks like anymore. What they care about is the quality of living, right? So when you would imagine to like uh, plan like a new city, you would think about like, should I build one big hospital or more small hospitals? Like what improves the quality of living of people in the city? How do I like uh, connect the hospitals via the roads and should there be like highways or small roads and where should be which? That's exactly our work. So we architect big systems and we think about like should there be like one big database or many small databases? Should there be network connections and, and where? And in this sense, like what we care about as architects is that quality of living inside the system, is the performance, is the security, is the testability, is the portability, are these quality criteria. Now, this is to set the scene, uh, but let's understand that like architecture is not its blueprint. It's not in real world in the buildings and it's not in software architecture as well. So what is a software architecture is not that structure, but that description of those quality principles that then guide the decisions of the software development team. So basically, when like, you are building a software architecture and you invite a software architect to your company, then they don't give you like, like a solution, a template, and say, you, hey, this is your architecture, just like program the individual pieces. What a software architect does is that they give you questions. They try to understand, they ask you about your stakeholders, their priorities, etc. And so uh, you, you start to understand that it's much more like into understanding, prioritizing, trade-off, and combining different understandings that the software architects are doing. So nowadays what makes software architecting difficult is that this like cyber and physical worlds meet together as we saw in that introduction talk. So things start to be critical because uh, things can really go wrong they are large distributed systems, they are interconnected and sometimes like untrusted elements connect into the infrastructure. And more so what's very important is that we are now architecting the systems to resist problems that we do not know yet. So we are basically architecting for the unknown. And there is where the diversity and the need of skills actually come into the picture. The engineering for the unknown. 
Because whenever you need to prepare something, you need to prepare like mechanism and resistance against something that is not there yet and might come in 10 years. While you as a software architect are architecting the system now, these decisions cannot be changed easily. You need to actually have really a uh, stretched way of thinking about what you are doing and how you are doing it. So um, for like in using a bit of my research, for example, one uh, student that I have in my team uh, is working, or it's my PhD student, is for example working on like how we can build in mechanisms in the systems that are able to understand that an insider attack in the organization is ongoing. Now when you think about it, it's, it's like you need to combine the knowledge of like psychological and sociological and technical and infrastructural all combined in one solution because when like an attacker is an employee of your organization, the attack can ongo be ongoing for like half a year or the whole year and can use different social engineering techniques to actually get on board different people on the organization, open different doors, but just slightly that you cannot really detect that. Uh, another student of mine uh, is working on forensic ready software systems, which is like if you imagine a situation that the security gets breached, which can happen, then it's very hard to decide like, and who is responsible? Why did it happen? How did it happen exactly? And to like hold this person who might be responsible accountable at court is like uh, close to impossible. Because even we are not really having the knowledge of what kind of data we need to collect so that the evidence is admissible at court. So in this research, we really work with lawyers, with people who know the legislation, but also people who know and, and understand how to like, enforce these techniques in companies that might be like, far behind, their systems might be 20, 30 years old. And like, there is, again, like many, many uh, fields of research that need to combine together. And one last example is uh, my favorite, like I just uh, have like two PhD students who started uh, this month um, because I love this topic so much. Uh, I want to grow this, this line of research and it's trust in autonomous ecosystems. Where you basically can imagine autonomous driving cars like meeting each other on a crossroad and they need to decide whether they trust each other. And uh, in those situations where these systems are distributed and one of them can have malicious intents hidden under like behavior that looks, uh, looks, looks uh, real, we really need to like, uh, now understand how would like, a person build trust in another, how could like, autonomous car build from these mechanisms to build trust in another autonomous driving car to avoid a collision. And now you see that like different uh, ecological, economical, technical, uh, psychological, sociological competencies and understandings and directions need to meet in one solution. And that is what like, makes me most excited by my research because that's really what, what, I, what I like the most. And in these areas, I see that we are doing, making mistakes. We are still, when we think about security, we are focusing on the doorway to the system. We are preventing the attacker in, in, in coming. Because we have too few people who think out of the box and say, hey, but what if they come? Like, are we ready for that? Are we ready to recognize they are in? Are we ready to recover? Uh, and we have so few research really like done in these intersections. Uh, so for example, from the forensic research or this trust, uh, trust perspective, we are really like uh, paving the way uh, in these research directions. Um, now this uh, thing like brings us to the question like what shall be the competencies of a software architect? If you ask company, they tell you they need to know different databases, they need to know different frameworks, they need to know different programming languages. Uh, but like ultimately, when you spend, spend like go deeper into this debate, you find out that they need to have the ability to understand, to envision, to trade off and to strategize. They need to have the breadth of knowledge instead of the depth of knowledge. They need to be good in communication, leadership, and decision making, and have the awareness and prevention of their cognitive biases. Because uh, the cognitive bias, the confirmation bias, that we make the decision too soon, typically means that we make the wrong decision. So ultimately, software architecture is the shared understanding of your experts, and the more diverse uh, your expert group is, the stronger the architecture will be. So this is like what motivates me to really think about, okay, so, are we like the right group of people in software architecture or do we need a stretch towards different competencies? 
And if you look at this, like I like this uh, kind of like visualization that people in like uh, the like computing community, you can really like look at that problem solving strategy, like towards which problem solving strategy they gravitate. Where one problem solving strategy is more like target oriented. So when I'm presenting a big problem, I decompose it in a sub problems and I go and solve each sub problem in isolation because that's the way to achieve results early. Or am I more like perspective oriented? That means I, I try to solve the problem like all at once, but it takes first to understand the map of the solution, to understand what are the factors connected to the solution, what are the past experience, the future predictions, and then I build the solution in parallel. And what happens is actually that in the software engineering and software architecture, we, have, we are strongly on the target side. We have many specialists, but we have too few generalists. We have too few people who are really able to interconnect, to communicate, to integrate solutions together. And why is that happening? It's because we created a funnel through our education system where we drive away these this kids who do not enjoy working on a single assignment and single coding assignment and debugging it the whole day. If they don't enjoy mm -hmm. it, we make them believe that they are not a good fit for computing. And that's why we actually eliminate this part of the problem solvers who just have different approach. And then we just narrow down. So we go into this group and narrow them down towards more target oriented when they go to university and more target oriented when they go to, to a PhD and even more target oriented when they become professors. And then we just lack this kind of competencies on the other side. Not surprisingly, when you look at like distribution of women, men uh, along these curves, we see many women who are eliminated in this way. And uh, we could discuss this, uh, the, the reasons for that, like why women are more towards the like perspective oriented mindset. There will be a combination of factors. There's definitely not a, like a single simple uh, answer to this. Uh, some people say that maybe uh, like the influence of like social bring up and the, f the fact that like women needs to like know it all, remember it all, handle it all, like makes them like have this competency stronger. On the other hand, some people say maybe it's the testosterone among men that like makes them more driven, they want to see the solution. So it's like when they see that I will get a solution earlier when I start decomposing and start solving sub problems in isolation, that they gravitate towards that direction. Like there are different actually ways how you can understand it. Uh, and I'm not an expert on like telling you exactly why it happens. But that's what's observed uh, within, uh, within the, the community. And what is the sad news is that we eliminate many women, actually, due to like, making them pass this uh, target-oriented test when, when they are starting their education. And if they do not show up to be enough specialists, we actually uh, steer them away. Uh, so uh, when we look at how we do that, how we actually eliminate these perspective-oriented individuals from the pipeline, it's actually first good to understand that they really like approach the problem differently. And when you are perspective oriented, you need to understand your context map first. So you actually spend time where you appear to be stuck. And you think it's too complex because you see the complexity. Maybe your colleague just doesn't see the complexity. Uh, and that's the thing, actually. It's not that the perspective oriented individual would be slower or less effective or, or not that smart. It's just they see bigger context than their colleague. And that's their advantage. That's not the disadvantage. That's not the reason why we should say, OK, you're not a good fit, because you take longer to understand, and you think it's too complex. Uh, so this is one thing. Like, they take longer. So the learning curve, which is like the, the pink one, is that like, they take time before they start delivering. And during that time, they are typically told by their teacher that they are not a good fit. Because what their teacher is trying to do is to predict that like blue curve of learning. And when they see that you start very low, they think, OK, this curve is not going anywhere. And they are typically not patient enough to spend time with these perspective-oriented individuals, like give them space in the classroom to really like grow. And I must say, I'm that kind of person. So I really struggle at the beginning. I saw that like, everything is too complex. I will never learn it. It's just incredibly complex. But now I must say that it's so easy for me to do things in parallel. It's so easy to do so many things, to be expert in many research areas. It's just easy. It's just easy for me. So another thing that is important to realize is that among those uh, kids that are perspective oriented, they typically have many interests. 
many major interests. It's not just like one interest, so that they would be able to resist that maybe the education is not really great, the teacher is not really supportive. They just resist it because they have their single interest. However, if you, as, as a child, have like multiple interests, that are like equally important to you, then what you do is that you just dismiss that direction when you do not seek support in that direction. It's very easy for you to say, okay, like my teacher in computing is not really supportive, I will go in biology, or I'll go in, in history, or I'll go in arts, or I'll go in languages, because I like them all. And again, like, the reason that th this kid likes them all is why we need them in computing, as I, uh, as I tried to explain at the beginning. And there is a specific <coughs> thing related to girls that is very nicely described in the book uh, Brave Not Perfect, that they often struggle with this concept that we socialize them for perfection, rather than bravery. And actually, being debugging in computing is a lot of bravery, where things fail and you need to start again, and you fail and you need to start again. And if you are socialized into perfection, this is like very difficult because it's attacking your identity. So, uh, what I want to say like towards those teachers specifically is that I understand the dark side of biases is that we tend to judge people's potential based on how their talent spectrum matches the already successful ones. So we see only like target-oriented people, specialists, as the successful ones. And when we see that kid who is more perspective, multidisciplinary, we say, hey, you do not really match the people I see who are already successful. And we try to protect those kids by steering them away. So uh, this is a vicious cycle that actually it reinforces itself. Um, uh, and let's now go into like more understanding of the Chiquitas and the context that we do. So one of the things we did uh, was like run very interesting study uh, on uh, actually first understanding why do women choose particular study programs and career as alternative to tech? And what are the triggers and benefits of these alternatives comparing to um, the tech? We also wanted to understand the obstacles, uh, steering them away, and understood like a very nice pipeline of the obstacles, like going through the lifetime. Uh, we also published this uh, study. So if you are interested in finding it, you can find it uh, on like, it was published in the IEEE journal, IEEE software. So you can find it there if you are interested. I'm happy to share the link later. So we designed the study in a way that we compared two personas. So like one persona of a woman who is in tech and one persona of a woman who would like to be in tech. And we wanted to understand like, why the one who wants to be in tech is not in tech? Like, how did it happen? Because she must have had this interest early on when she was a little kid. So when did it happen that she actually dropped out and, and she, she went away and, and why? And we discovered that actually the understandings of like both personas are very similar. The thing is that those who are in tech are more resilient. That's the thing. They either didn't notice that there are some frustrations that they feel along the way, or they just resisted them. So let's look at those like steps on the pipeline. So the first one uh, that they mentioned was access to encouragement. And that is something that like girls perceive very strongly when they are little. Like, Am I encouraged to go in that direction or not? And as often like they are really interested in multiple things, multiple areas, then it's very easy to them to go into direction towards which they are encouraged. Uh, the second was stereotypes, but interestingly, not their stereotypes, but the stereotypes of their family protecting them from a career path where the family didn't believe they could succeed. Because the family, their mothers, for example, wanted their little girls to be happy in their life. And if the mother does not envision this as a happy path for, for her little daughter, she was protecting her from going in that direction, which was very interesting because it was like, help us understand like a different way we see it. It's not like the evil family preventing the girls into going in that direction. Is, is, is that like, missing knowledge on the level of the parents who are trying to protect their daughters. And that's why also like in Chiquitas, we are so happy to work with mothers uh, because we believe that we are helping the future generation. Because the mother is often the biggest role model for the little girl who is understanding like how, world, uh, how, how the world works. The third like that was hit by those girls who continue in the direction was the confidence. They really like many of them uh, understood that like they like different fields, they like different things, and they are just slower adopters of technology. And that's frustrating because you find yourself in a classroom with earlier adopters. 
And there it's very difficult to catch up, especially when you're on that lower learning curve and you're starting later. It's like close to impossible to actually catch up, especially when you are socialized for perfection and you have like all A's in all other courses. Uh, those who stayed and remained resilient had another one, which is the sense of belonging, where they just find themselves in a classroom where there were just like one or two girls, and which made it really difficult for them to like feel comfortable. Uh, and the last one is feeling valued. And this one is very interesting because when you saw this like, um, uh, actually the, the um, direction that you can be like target oriented or perspective oriented, like women are of course also like target oriented as well as perspective oriented. Like you find them on both sides of the spectrum, just in different distributions, but on both sides of the spectrum. And those who are target uh, distributed say that I am tired of proving them wrong. I'm just tired whenever I enter a room I first need to put my effort into showing that I'm good enough and then actually I can be myself. And for the women on the other side of spectrum with having non-stereotypical skills, more like perspective oriented, multidisciplinary, they were actually like pretending and mimicking uh, the efforts of the majority group, which make them exhausted. So actually exha exhaustion is like, like emotion that they describe a lot. Either exhaustion from like proving them wrong, or exhaustion from like trying to pretend I'm specialist, even in, in the heart I'm not, and not allowing themselves to actually shine through their own strengths and competence and, and like uh, talents that they have. Yeah, so uh, this brings us to like understanding that different way of like education and embracing multidisciplinary, that multidisciplinarity, but also in the setup, how we, for example, evaluate people in the academic setup. Like, like if, we, if we really give ourselves this, this question, like if you are multidisciplinary in the academic setup, what chances do you have to really like grow academically? It's difficult. It's, it's really like di more difficult. So uh, in Chiquitas, we are trying to help the situation. It actually started in 2014 by understanding that in the Czech Republic, we have a very specific situation of the situation, like it's very hard to find competent people on tech positions. So we are actually the first in Europe, according to statistics, in the difficulty to uh, find a person for a tech vac vacancy. So it's most difficult here in the Czech Republic. And at the same time, we are the last in representation of women in tech. So actually we have here like reservoirs of talent we are not using and our economy is suffering without it. So it, it is very logical uh, to make a step towards like inviting those girls who want to join tech to join it. And that's actually what's happening. So these women want to join tech. They are interested. And the fact that you do not find them in computer science classroom is because they do not identify with the way we teach computing and with, with, with which we evaluate them and their fit for computing. So we started with uh, more popularization activities and uh, then move towards working with children, teachers, and school headmasters, landing in requalification academies, which are three months program, like bringing women from like point zero to very junior, junior position in tech in three months of really hard work and commitment to continue growing when being on that junior position, of course, so continue learning and continue evolving. But this became really successful. So we now have a group of like 100 companies we work with and we have uh, over 30,000 graduates uh, today, uh, to date uh, with uh, over 600 volunteers. Um, we like, have the mission to inspire and empower new talents for stronger diversity and competitiveness in tech. It doesn't need to be just women. Uh, we work with teachers and we work with, with other um, like spectrums and groups of people. But of course, like in the Czech Republic, we see this huge reservoir of talent on the side of women. So uh, this is the data from 2020. So 2021 is even bigger. Uh, it's 1,000 courses that we organized. And some of them are really three months courses. So uh, the effort is, is huge on that side. We are located in, uh, in 10 cities in the Czech Republic uh, nowadays, so, so having 10 teams. And the core team of like really employees is, uh, is uh, of size uh, around 80 people who are like full-time employed. Um, 
We work with parents, public companies. Uh, if you are a parent, then on Saturday you should definitely come to visit Chiquita's house. We have some activities for children. It's free of charge. Like anybody's welcome to play with some robots within the Fab Lab and, and to, to play with uh, the small other bots uh, and doing activities really for, for, for families of children. So you are all invited, uh, definitely come. Uh, uh, we also have activities for public. So for example, today there is a meetup with Brno AI in Chiquitas. Again, everybody's welcome. Uh, and we have different activities uh, that uh, are trying to make the outreach uh, even, even bigger. Um, yeah, we work with teachers. We have teacher academies. We work with high school kids. So now we are running uh, like a program of like digital skill sets for high school kids, again, like free of charge. Um, many of the programs are paid, especially when they are requalification programs, uh, also because of the commitment of the people attending it. It's like much bigger. Uh, but we are trying to actually uh, run on a basis of volunteering plus uh, funding from different grants and supporters uh, so that we can make uh, the education approachable. Um, the topics are very diverse, so like uh, we actually have over like 100 topics that we teach. Um, these are some like main categories, so like themes uh, going into the like web design, data science, uh, coding, software development, testing, etc. Um, we have different formats. Like what works best is that for popularization activities, it's just one day Saturday activity where you just kind of like, it, it, it's, it's a tasting of that topic. Uh, then if you want to go further, you can go into Academy, which is like really three months program. Those, those are really like dedicated to women and, and girls. Uh, for other activities, it depends. Like many are for, for women and girls because of that reservoir of talent that we want to lift up. Uh, but there are some that are for general public as well. Um, as for the career changers, uh, these programs are very successful. We are really happy about it. It's also the, like the kind of design we do for uh, those like career changing programs because what we do is that we try to run it on a community basis. So in this three months career program, uh, career changer program, for example, data science, we combine many volunteers, but also many companies. Like it's like five companies uh, that provide mentors. So those women in the programs are really doing their own project into their own portfolio. They have a mentor from a company. Uh, they also have some additional like sub courses. So it looks like a semester. It has its courses within uh, data science on, for example, the Python development, the uh, different databases, uh, different uh, like visualization tools like uh, business intelligence uh, tools, uh, for example, statistics, etc. So it looks like a small semester, uh, but doing like tailored uh, to fit even uh, women who are working or who are having small children. So during the week, having it in the evening, like five to nine p.m., and then during the weekend, they can like meet for the holiday. So it's really like. We, we really try to make it approachable, especially to these uh, vulnerable groups, uh, like women who's with small children. Um, yeah, so we, we've received many, many uh, recognitions for our work, and really, we are really, really happy about that. Actually, uh, yesterday, uh, there was uh, in, in Slovenia uh, announcement of the winner of the Social Economy Awards uh, 2021, and we won this uh, in the uh, digitalization and scale category across Europe. Uh, 118 uh, organizations competed for that prize. So this is uh, our Olga just collecting the prize in, uh, in Ljubljana uh, yesterday. So we yeah, are really happy about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and that's it. So for the final wrap up, I just mentioned to a few people, if you are in research, you are interested in uh, the, the theme of like uh, gender balance in informatics research, then we run this uh, beautiful community uh, within the cost action framework of, of Europe, uh, which is called uh, European Network for Gender Balance in Informatics. Uh, within this network, uh, I, uh, I'm like uh, honored to act as a vice chair of the, of the network. We have 38 uh, countries uh, who are uh, represented in this uh, in this network, and we are meeting in Madrid uh, in two weeks. So looking forward to that. Uh, and that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to share uh, what what I what I can share. Thank you very much. So if you have any question, I have a microphone ready for you. And if you have any question and you are watching us online, you can type it uh, into the bar that is under the video. So, so 
that we would like to encourage you to ask as well. I will check it on the notebook, so I will ask for you. So, do I see any hands up? Not yet, so maybe I will ask, because uh, I was really moved when I listened to you, and I was thinking that maybe if I heard you 15 years ago, my career might be different. <laughs> so, is there any... Uh, uh, is it late to begin with some IT career, or oh, it I just depends? It. I love the question on oh. passion <laughs> and. I, I love the question. I um, because like if you ask me like why I invest because I invest a lot of effort uh, to take it as like next to my academic career, and why I do that is that I want to show women that it's never too late. It's never too late because it's something that they keep saying from the age of twelve that it's too late because their brother is, is, is coding since the age of eight. So in 12, it's too late to start. Then in 15, it's again too late to start, right? And that is, some, that is like the, the sentence I hear the most often. Like, I would like to try, but I think I'm not good enough. And I think it's maybe too late to start. So what we show is never too late to start. I can, I can uh, share a story of, of a woman uh, who, uh, with, with Chicky Desk, actually changed their career completely after having four children. Uh, wow. having, having chronic disease problems. Uh, she had her first child actually when she was age 18 before she graduated from high school. So like she, she had her like life very difficult now like being 10 years home with her children and basically not having any working experience besides like helping at a, uh, at the front desk of uh, some reception. And she decided to make a change. Uh, now she's working as a tester in a company. She loves it. She's already leading another younger woman who also joined through the Chiquitas program of the Tester Academy. And I must say that actually when you talk to companies, and I do as, as a vice dean for industrial corporation, what the companies tell you is that we care about the attitude of the person. We care if they want to learn, they want to grow, they have the growth mindset. They are ready to work hard. And in these like programs of Chiquitas, they find exactly these candidates. So these are women who know they need to work hard. And it is hard. Like many of them tell you that it was the hardest three months in their life because they really need to work hard. They need to like rethink the limiting beliefs they have about themselves. Uh, but what happens is that they actually be became like a higher value asset for the company because they showed they are able to really like invest and uh, with the right attitude, they are a great pick for the company, even if they are really, they will need another few years of, you know, like continuing learning within the position. But, but these stories are really beautiful, especially because these women are coming back to us, uh, saying, you changed my life, and that's super beautiful. <laughs> well, congratulations, not only to that, but to all the awards and to everything that you do, because it's so fascinating and important. There is a question. Did I see it right? No, no, no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> because I can keep asking you again, but I will check someone on, online if, if he or she asks something. Not yet. Well, uh, there is a question. <laughs> uh, I'm Katerina Tidlačková from Saitek here, and I'm sorry for my voice. It's a little bit cracked. But uh, I would like to ask, I have a nine years old daughter, so how I can introduce you to the field of IT, what you spoke about? Yeah, like uh, I would say that like kids learn really easily if they find uh, like certain like uh, things that fascinate them. So I think like for, for each kid, uh, some kids are really like fascinated by certain things like creativity, for example. So it's, it's great to connect ID with the creativity, like something they are already passionate about. Like think about like what they are passionate about. Like my, my son is passionate about construction engineering. So like connect ID with construction engineering, mm -hmm. right? Uh, when they are, uh, you know, like passionate about, uh, I don't know, animals. Like it is possible to like connect it to the other discipline. And I think like we are cultivating people to understand that ID is a tool and they can use this tool to advance their understanding and their learning in a direction that where they have their passion directed. And then the second thing which I think is, is very important is uh, to be an example how we react to situations. So for example, uh, what, what we often do uh, without knowing is that when something technical breaks down, we just call somebody to correct it, like do something with it, you know? like and. So, so this, is, this is the role modeling without being aware 
uh, right, for those little girls, especially because they are seeing their mom. And then what actually happens, and we, we heard it in the study, is that these girls say that what was actually the problem was that they, when they are trying to program something and they were struggling and ask, for example, father for help, what the father did in the best intent is take away the keyboard and solve it. You know, because, because their father was not patient enough to guide them through it. Like, well, their mother, for example, when they were learning to do something else, was patient enough and say, try it, try it, and, and, and be patient because you need to spend time with her learning and you need to interfere too much. But often the dad in the coding assignment was just like, give it to me, it's done. You know, like this, this, kind, of, this kind of approach. And it was the best intent, right? To help her have the solution soon. But what, she, what she's learning? She's learning that this is how you do it. So, so I would say like be the role model uh, in, in that case. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, be the role model and then, then, then really like follow her passions, you know, not, not to change her into something, but like follow her passions because what we understood, like also when you study like how girls and boys interact with technology, it's very interesting, very interesting. So there are different patterns of interacting with technology. What boys offer do, often do is they challenge, they want to break it, they want to see like, how far need I go, do, that, do I need to go so that it breaks? You know, like challenge the limits of the technology. What girls often do is that they have a, they have a goal and they want the shortest path to that goal. If that program is doing it on itself, I need, do not need to do anything with it, I will just use it. It's actually stupid not to just use it as it is, right? Because, because I, have, I have a goal. Well, if I need to change something in the program so that I get to, guide, to, to my goal, they do not hesitate to change it because they need to get to that goal. Like, it's, it's a different mindset. So, for example, I, I have a friend who, has a, who is a developer of mobile applications, and she said, I started the way that I had a computer game, and I hated the clothes of that little figures. I wanted nicer clothes of those little figures. But in that game, I didn't know how to change it, so I needed to go into the code to find where the clothes is stored, to draw my own clothes, to import it into the game, to recompile, and then I could play it. And <laughs> And this is like, she had a goal and she, she wasn't afraid to use like any tools, like difficult tools to, to reach her goal. But, but if the clothes was already there, she wouldn't learn it, right? And it's, it's really like documented by studies that is just different way of interacting with the technology. So sometimes we make the technology like too ready-made for the, for the girls. So we do not give them reason to like dig, dig in. Another question. Thank you very much. Um, thank you much for the talk. Uh, it was excellent. Uh, this is the third time I hear it, and uh, every single time I'm impressed and, and touched. <laughs> um, but I understand you work as an NGO, um, and uh, NGOs have quite a hard time in Czech Republic. Uh, do you feel much support from the official kind of um, um, official, like uh, uh, Mr. is over there, I can see, and, uh, mm -hmm. and government? Uh, do you feel much, much support, or do you feel that there might be some some way to put your curriculum into schools and uh, make it far more widespread. Uh, yeah, so, so I would say like, uh, the, the, like the systematic uh, support is not there. Like we, we find different, different ways, uh, but it's more through interaction with uh, like the, the local teams, for example, at the South Moravian Center who are like going to schools and then like working together and doing activities together. Uh, from uh, the Ministry of Education, uh, they uh, have some like funding schemes, so we were applying for funding, but it's still uh, like the, the biggest amount was 3% of the budget of the organization that was from uh, the public funding. So, so far it's more from the private sector, like uh, when it comes to funding. Um, on the other hand, uh, I would say that um, like the schools and officers are um, supportive, uh, but still, it typically like lands on, on the head of the school headmaster who is like too busy to think about improving situations. Uh, sometimes uh, it very, really depends. So we are in touch with some, some schools, but they are still like fraction, very small fraction 
uh, of the overall of the overall picture. But uh, we have some like academies for teachers. We work with organizations who are introducing uh, now the, the the framework programs for the schools, like the teaching syllabus uh, that is like now was approved and will be in action uh, since 2023, 25, depending on which kind of school. So we are in touch with these organizations, uh, but I would say that it's still like finding way to do like large scale change on the level of the schools. Also because in the schools, uh, our age, uh, average age in the teachers is over 50 and it's typically women. Uh, and for them, it's very difficult to actually change um, the way we, they approach things. And that's not a criticism, it's just, it's hard for them. It's uh, like, they, they were not taught the things and they are able to like very well reproduce what they were taught, but this is something very, 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 very new. <laughs> I think that we have space for uh, the last question. So if you have any, just, just let me know so I can pass you a microphone. Don't be afraid. <laughs> if you will not ask it, I will use the time for asking myself because I'm very curious. Uh, you have a support of many uh, technological partners, so maybe it answers my question, but uh, still I would like to ask if the HR departments and the managers in tech companies realize all that you mentioned in your speech, uh, like what are the qualities of women and if they really can make a good match for a position and a man or a woman. Yeah, so, so what I often see is that within each company we work with, and it's 100 companies, uh, there is an advocate. Uh, but then the rest of the company as well. <laughs> so the, the advocate is typically like coming to us and say like, can you, can you come over and like help us make them understand. Uh, because what we see is that often the advocates are more like advocates of the vision, but not really able to put it into actionable steps and words. So that they are not really listened to by the management in the company. So sometimes we do talk to management of the company and, and it often runs great because uh, uh, we, we have certain like ways to talk to them and like we understand each other because we are engineers and they are engineers. So it's easier to actually find a way to understand each, each other and have like much closer dialogue and listen to each other as well to like understand. So we are doing these programs. So for example, in this year, I myself participated in uh, like talking to hundreds of managers and actually we have a plan in November to approach another hundreds of managers in, of, of certain companies. Um, so let's let let's see how things uh, change because the thing is that like for them uh, uh, it's easy to get them on board during the event, but it's so easy for them to forget about it like when they move out of the lecture room. So we are also like training ambassadors in those companies uh, so that they can like sustain uh, this like pushing the information throughout the company while not shaming and blaming anybody, but rather like helping them understand that there's a huge opportunity. There is a huge opportunity and they might miss this opportunity. And there, there is a quote which is a little like strong, but it's saying that diversity is the new Darwinism. So the companies either need to evolve or get ready to that they might get extinct. And that might happen because if they miss uh, the way to connect to those reservoirs of talent, others will. And soon they will be out of the game uh, through the job market because it's, it takes time to change the way we appreciate people of different talents. So um, it is something to start working on real early and understanding it. Okay, it's an investment. I will not see the result this year, not even next year. It's an investment, but it's an investment that I need to do early. Otherwise, it, it might be too late. There is another comment uh, that is from our viewer online, but it's not finished. So uh, I would like to encourage uh, uh, Vishaka Sharma, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it well, uh, to finish it. And once it's finished, I will then ask you to type in maybe the mm -hmm. answer. Yeah, perfect. So, so, so perfect. she can be heard. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you once very much. Once again, I think it deserves a round of applause. <laughs>